Hey there athletes, Coach John Ferry here from Team Wilpers. Very excited as always to welcome you to our athlete briefing number six for both our winter run and half marathon run challenge. So I hope you know, everyone is working here very hard on week five. I hope you're having an outstanding week. The winter run group is continuing to hammer the intensity of those anaerobic capacity intervals and threshold intervals on inclines. Some nice hard work there by the winter run group and our half marathoners continuing to work on that endurance and sub threshold energy zone. So we're stringing together a lot of time at half marathon pace this week. Really hoping uh, you're enjoying that interval workout there, starting to get some association with that half marathon pace. And then as always, we finish out together with a nice easy long run to close out our week. Just a reminder, as always, continue to keep going into that website, checking the box, saying that I did the workout and chasing that 100% completion percentage. It is absolutely the best way to put yourself in a position to be successful at the either uh, end of your challenge or race experience. Now let's jump in to our week six workout. So we're gonna start winter run. Run number one, back again to the anaerobic capacity intervals. So once again, combination of one and two minute intervals. I said last week, I'll stay true to my word, two minutes is as long as we're going in those intervals. So I think as many people found out this week, two minutes can become tough for sure. So the best way to improve upon something is to repeat the process, kind of try again. So whether or not you struggled through that workout or really excelled, we're gonna find hopefully some progress immediately as well as being able to compare results in close proximity. So go back in, slightly different structure, but one and two minute intervals working at that anaerobic capacity pace. The good news, speaking to the you know anyone out there who might have struggled in that workout, is if you're pushing yourself to the max like that, you're getting a ton of benefit out of that workout. It means you're really challenging that energy zone, energy zone that doesn't get touched that much, especially by adult athletes. So the struggle is good. And so go back into it this week with an open mind, give it a good uh, hard shot again, and let's see, hopefully you found some improvement already here in just a one week time. Key run number two for winter run crew, VO2 max interval. So I kind of believe within the last couple weeks, I've mentioned our threshold work on incline, sort of a sneaky VO2 max workout anyway, because kind of using that resistance of the hill to make the workout harder, obviously. So now we're removing the resistance, if you will, and kind of putting that pace back onto flat. So remove the resistance, a little bit of extra pace onto the flat. The reason, the real reason I wanna introduce that VO2 max work right here, this part of the challenge, is for a lot of people, it's gonna be in and around what that 20 minute distance test pace is. So I wanna to touch on it this week in kind of some short and controlled intervals. So I think a lot of people will find this much easier actually than then the hill repeats at threshold. Uh, I want to advance on it a little bit the following week, and then our that kind of final week of our challenge is going to be test time, so where you're going to have to kind of excel at it and hold it for an extended period of time. So introducing that VO2 max interval right here, wanting you to get really associated with it, that's what you have coming up for key run number two. Don't be intimidated by the vernacular. That VO2 max, slower than obviously anaerobic capacity, uh, in this week, not so much of the longer intervals, staying at that two minutes. But once again, I think a lot of people are going to find this even a little bit easier than those uh, threshold repeats. Half marathoners, key run number one, straight endurance run. So we're removing the striders, removing any complication. What we're doing is adding volume here. So in running, we really only have three variables to work with. We have volume, we have frequency, we have intensity. So on key one, uh, uh, key run one and three this week, we're adding volume to both workouts. So the week in general is really about doing a bump up of volume across the board here. When we do those bump ups in volume, you have to be super cognizant, super careful to make sure you keep the pace relaxed. Not a great time to fall into the trap of complicating the workout, uh, running a little bit faster. You wanna keep the pace relaxed so we get that higher total volume here. Because our key run number two, half marathon pace hill run. So half marathoners, your time to hit the hills. Our, run, our winter run group has been nailing them. It's been a few weeks for you all, so, but you're up this week. So just a reminder, since we haven't touched it in a couple of weeks, what we're really looking for here is generating leg power, efficiency in stride, and proficiency in running hills 
in the race of your choice. So those are kind of our three main takeaways on the hill workouts here. I am, however, going to put a B goal onto this workout, which is I want you to keep the pace light in this, uh, in this kind of B goal here, but absolutely use this as an opportunity to practice your downhill running as much as your uphill running. Not going to work out for our treadmill runners out there, unfortunately, but if you're running this workout outside, you should really be using this as an opportunity not only to practice working hard on the up, but being thoughtful on the down. So there was a question last week. We talked a little bit about uh, tactics and strategies, form cues for downhill running. It's just kind of a reminder we want to be have a slight downward tilt, allowing gravity to help assist us down the hill. We want to focus on soft, light footfalls. Don't want to hear that loud thudding or clapping of feet hitting the ground. Um, and want to keep our turnover nice and quick. Quick turnover on the downhills going to aid with that soft footfall. So definitely give it a little bit of a practice. Don't try to work up to tempo of running downhill fast here. That's not the point because I still want you to recover, recover during those intervals. But definitely take advantage of the time running downhill to start working on some of that proficiency as well. We all come back together with a long run. So we're finishing with nice, easy miles across the board. Half marathoners, however, and any run runner in particular who is starting to go up into their a uh, little bit longer than maybe even target on the winter run side. So as runs start to tip past 90 minutes, and some people might already be there and other people are gonna very rapidly enter this territory, is really where you start to think about using intra-workout nutrition as part of that kind of workout experience to balance out energy levels. So anything up over 90 minutes, you wanna to start to think about taking in some, usually it's carb rich, protein low, fiber low, very easily digestible uh, something. So it comes in certainly gels, chews, uh, drink powders, etc. All things that allow you to take in a little bit of nutrition during your workout there. Additionally, we do an amazing job of drinking a lot of fluids in warm weather, but we still need it, especially in these longer workouts in cold weather. We're still losing a lot of fluid due to sweat, it tends to evaporate much, much faster in the cooler, drier conditions, but we're still losing it. So make sure, especially as these workouts get longer, that you're not forgetting to take in fluids as you go. My favorite kind of rule of thumb on the how much to drink, when to drink, etc., goes all the way back to its most simplistic, which is drink when you're thirsty. There are plenty of formulas out there, plenty of people that will argue the formulas. I like drink when you're thirsty, so we're going to go with that for now. Jump straight into questions from the group now. So first question here was finding time to do the longer runs is a challenge. Is it okay to do 45 minutes in the afternoon and 45 in the evening around my work schedule to make sure I get the nine miles in in a day? So it's a great question. And unfortunately, it's not ideal. The reason being is there's kind of a ramp up period to get to start getting the benefit of a, an endurance workout, if you will. And usually that ramp up period is around 20, we'll call it for, uh, for sake of this example here, 20 minutes. So you don't really start getting the benefit of your endurance workout until over 20 minutes into the workout. So if you're doing a 30 minute workout, you really have 10 minutes of endurance um, you know, benefit that comes with that. So in this example here, if you're splitting this thing up in a 45-45, you're getting about 25 minutes of benefit on the first run, 25 minutes of benefit on the second run, you get about 50 minutes of total benefit of, of that kind of building endurance. And in a 90 consecutively, you've got about 70 minutes of endurance benefit. So you're getting 20 additional minutes of kind of peak training time where you're making um, you know, big impacts on the energy zone as opposed to breaking it up the other way. So obviously a, a preferable way to go about it. That being said, sometimes you have to do what you have to do. So if it's not gonna happen uh, consecutively, breaking it up is an option. You just have to be thoughtful that you're not quite getting the benefit out of it. So if you think logging the miles is gonna really help like getting towards the 13.1 consecutive, it is, but not in quite the same capacity. So once again, it's much better than not doing it at all or only being able to do half, but ideally you need to find that time to string those long runs together and make them consecutive. 
Next question here was, uh, how do you return to running after an illness? Ended up getting COVID and had to take a full week off doing nothing. I understand to slowly build back up, but how long should I take to do that? A couple days, a week, two weeks, any insight would be helpful. So certainly cold, flu, and COVID season uh, out there uh, have athletes experiencing all of them at the same time currently. So unfortunately, there's no full right answer. It just kind of depends a lot on your scenario, the severity, the toll on your body, etc. cetera. Um, I'm going to back into this if it's all right. So the first thing I ask my athletes that come to me and say either they're coming back from illness, COVID seems big right now, is if they wear a, a wearable of some sort. And when I say a wearable, I mean kind of a, a whoop device the Aura Ring, uh, a lot of smart watches like Apple Watch has made a lot of advancements in this. And if so, those devices tend to track uh, RHR, which resting heart rate and uh, heart rate variabil variability, which has become very widely discussed over the last many years. So resting heart rate in particular, the tracking of it's been around a long, long time. You do it manually in the morning, just with uh, you know fingers to th your, your neck and a, a stopwatch. But these devices have made it much more easy, much more accessible for a lot of people. So that resting heart rate in particular really shouldn't vary more than about two to three beats a minute as long as everything's healthy. But when you get sick, when you get stressed, it can be way off, 10, 15, 20 beats. And we, see it, we were seeing it in COVID all the time, 20 plus beats a minute off from baseline, which is a, a great indicator that your system is nowhere close to a capacity to, to be doing much, really anything other than crawling back in bed and pulling up a blanket. And in which case, the best case scenario is to stay away from all activity, get the rest, let that RHR come back down into a normal range. And then I'm not gonna talk too much about heart rate variability right now, other than that's sort of the cross reference to RHR. So when both of those metrics are back down in a normal range, you know that you're pretty good to resume activity. So if you don't have that, you don't have that kind of uh, data, if you will, to go off, you know, the first and most important thing is take the rest, make sure that you feel recovered, feel that you're physically able to get back into it. If you're fe still feeling the side effects of an illness, you are a body under stress. I t tell my athletes all the time, it's not smart. We don't want to take a body under stress and apply more stress to it. We need a good, healthy body to work with, and then I'll be happy to apply the stress to it as you all have all become aware. So for all runners, I kind of have a, a, I usually break this down into a three-part kind of return to play protocol, if you will. So week one is to re return lower intensity, lower volume. So if you're running intervals, you're running these hard anaerobic capacity intervals and hill repeats, we're coming back almost exclusively easy running at a lower volume than you were doing before. Week, week two of this uh, kind of return to play is intensity stays low, potentially starting to include some things like strides, uh, little pickups, maybe uh, some, some fart licks, which we've kind of played around with in the past here, but you know, pretty low key workouts, but get that volume, that total volume of the week back to where you left off your, your kind of baseline. And then week three is a resume to full running. So if you kind of, and, and all of you have followed the kind of the structure of how we do loading and unloading weeks. We talk about the benefit of the unloading week being a, a way to kind of re refresh, relax, get back in, uh, you know, a little bit fresher than you were before. It also offers a really great opportunity as a catch-up week sometimes. So when I say that, I say it with great hesitation because it's not a catch-up week where you're like, I'll just skip this week and go keep going on to the next week. Where it usually lands is that, you know, this is a two, three week process to kind of get back from illness is when you take that unload at wherever it falls in that process is sometimes you can bounce back and kind of push ahead the following week and kind of get back in line with where you, you needed to be. So sometimes it works, sometimes not, but it is a, a kind of silver lining benefit to those deload weeks is that they do allow a little bit of a, a catch up sometimes if you fall behind. We're gonna move on here to a question on hill intervals. The hill intervals um, felt hard, even though my anaerobic capacity pace is higher, it, it feels nearly as hard. Any advice or is this part of the training? So, 
Should I try not to walk in the recoveries, the anaerobic capacity and hills both had me needing a walk for about a minute after the longest interval, running both on the treadmill at 4% incline. So kind of two parts here, two things we'll break down. The hills on threshold feeling harder than the anaerobic capacity intervals, faster pace. Uh, kind of part B to this is walking during the recovery. So we'll start hill, um, kind of that kind of training stress, if you will, of hills on threshold. So part one, not shocking at all that the hills on threshold are feeling harder than the anaerobic capacity. I think I kind of said a little bit earlier today, you know, this is kind of a sneaky VO2 max and potentially even another anaerobic capacity workout hidden, but we're using the incline as resistance here. So overall, it's absolutely part of the training. Um, and so in this workout, we're, do, we're targeting a very similar energy zone. We have very similar objectives to the workout, but what we're doing is using that incline, as I was saying, to add resistance instead of more speed. So the reason that I, I wanted to do that for these workouts is actually running on incline actually puts less impact onto the body. Uh, your front foot, your landing foot is a little bit higher up. It's closer to the ground. So you don't take the same impact as running another high speed interval session, if you will. Also, when running on incline versus flat versus decline, we're using different musculature in our body. And the muscles that we are using, we're using differently depending upon if we're going up, flat, or down. So in this workout, once again, we get an opportunity to target basically the same energy zone, still very challenging intervals, but we do it using uh, a little bit lower impact on the body than let's say the anaerobic capacity intervals. We use a slightly different musculature and using those muscles in different ways than the anaerobic capacity intervals. So the workout is certainly not designed to be easier than the other one. And as I think you found out, it, it, certainly for a lot of people, it might feel even harder than running that faster pace on, uh, on flat. So hopefully in this week, when we take away that incline, that VO2 max starts to feel very comfortable to you. In terms of the recovery and walking recoveries here, it is ideal to maintain a light jog and not go all the way to that walk pace. Uh, the pace of that recovery is pretty irrelevant. However, as a matter of fact, it's probably usually less than like even your easy pace range. And the reason that I want you to stay jogging in that interval is that when you go to the walk, your heart rate, it just drops very rapidly. Uh, and ultimately, we don't want that kind of hard drop off right there. So when you go to restart after that heart rate is kind of, we'll say, for, has kind of plunged uh, after a minute of walking, really dropped almost all the way back down to easy pace, actually a lot harder to get restarted and going again than as opposed to if you kind of made it a more gradual shift. So it's not the end of the world if you do need a quick walk just to kind of get your composure, but I would uh, urge you to keep it less than 30 seconds, even less than 20 seconds if you can, to make actually the transition easier getting back into the next interval. So moving on here, uh, warm-ups and cool-downs. Do you prefer these done separately or in conjunction with the session work? I've been seeing elite runners separate these even going as far as to warm up, cool down into different shoes, outfits, etc. Taking short breaks in between the main set. Is this a thing we should consider? Benefits, advantages, or warm up, main set, cool down all together, done of things. So more often than not, I want these things together, uh, especially for a race like the marathon, which is the asker of this question is preparing for. Uh, but also the half marathon in particular, the workouts really do tend to flow together a little bit. The paces are not so intense in a lot of these workouts that you need to, uh, to really stop, refresh, change shoes in the middle of the workout, etc. However, for shorter distance workouts, shorter distance specialists, people doing really high intense, uh, intensity intervals, this is actually really going to apply to our, our winter run crew right now. It absolutely could make sense to break these things up and spend a little bit more time in warm-up sessions to get your body ready, etc. So just kind of using that as an example, we'll kind of talk about these anaerobic capacity intervals where we're working really, really hard. You might want to start with something like the lunge matrix, get your body moving in three dimensions before you uh, kind of get started. Go into your easy run, maybe run a couple miles, get your heart rate elevated, your body generally warmed up. And then it wouldn't be uncommon at all for, let's say, track teams, for 
uh, professional runners to kind of stop, work through some of the maybe uh, aches and pains they're experiencing that day, do a couple mobilization routines or stretches. Very, very common to then go into a stride protocol, very similar to what we do, run the strides back and forth, see how they're feeling, increase the pace with those strides as they kind of uh, continue to warm up a little bit. Wouldn't uh, Once again, you could kind of stop after that, go into more of your drills, you know, skips, uh, side skips, you know, side crossovers, etc. There's a lot of different things depending upon what the athlete is working on in the scope of the day. Those are all t- moving towards trying to get their body prepped to perform at an incredibly high level. So in terms of the gear, just because you mentioned it here, in a similar vein, you know, if you're working around, especially a 400 meter track, it might be more comfortable to run your warm-ups in a recovery shoe, something that's nice and cushy you feel good with, and then change into something that's a little snappier for your key workout. A lot of these uh, track athletes, too, are going to be using spikes on the track. So something that you really don't want to warm up in, something you definitely don't want to cool down in. They're not super comfortable, but that might be a specialty shoe that they're using for that type of workout, uh, potentially. So the stop start is okay because, once again, it's ultimately moving towards getting your body ready to perform. But, once again, I I would kind of save it and utilize it much more often. Those athletes working at super high intensity, you know, focusing on short, hard intervals in a workout. And for the athletes, you know, focusing on endurance, races, events, and training, you want to string that together as much as possible. Keep your heart rate elevated because we're focusing on that long distance completion. The final reason you kind of alluded to it in your your question here is time is a real deal. Uh, I would love nothing more than to be able to give 30, 40 minutes of warm up and cool down time on either side of an exercise to give athletes two hour sessions. More often than not, my athletes don't have that kind of time on their morning consistently, five, six, uh, seven days a week sometimes it's gonna be something that has to be accomplished in a little bit more compact manner. So if I can, <laughs> I certainly feel good, if I can get uh, the five, 10 minutes of, of warm up and mobilization work that I want, a couple miles of, uh, of warm up, tie it together all in the workout, it's gonna be a little bit different scenario from the pros that are doing this as their full-time job. Well, everyone, that is it for week six. Thanks as always for being here. I hope you have an incredible week. And I can't wait to see you back here next time.